All right, good morning. You should hear the afternoon this morning. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner, and uh, it's International Women's Month. Uh, last uh, May, on March 8th, it was International Women's Day, and that started in a place called Santa Rosa, California, which is in the wine country in California, in Northern California, where a bunch of women got together and saluted, saying, Two women! And the United Nations picked up on it, and it became International Women's Month. So that's what we're celebrating. And uh, Richard Nixon, oh, I'm not a crook. Um, Richard Nixon, I, I dealt with Nixon. I dealt with Nixon between 1985 and 1988. My career as a journalist, uh, he uh, settled the Mace, uh, Major League Baseball umpires dispute. Um, with the owners and gave the uh, umpires a 40% raise. And I got to see him around New York a lot over the four or five year period. And one day uh, I said to him, um, oh, good morning, Mr. President. He said, uh, uh, no, Evan, uh, uh, call me Dick. And ever since then it was Dick Nixon. So uh, anyway, uh, we traveled without Secret Service people around him was amazing to me in New York. But anyway, this guy is responsible for changing the lives of hundreds of millions of Americans, and now you're talking uh, over the cost, course of nearly 52 years. He signs the Title IX uh, legislation into law, and basically it gives women an equal opportunity at education. Uh, higher education in the United States. Um, it used to be hardly any women were in medical school or, or law school or even grad school or electric engineering school, uh, but he leveled the playing field. This guy, Richard Nixon. Uh, the Patsy T. Make Equal Opportunity in Education Act. Education Amendments of 1972 or Title IX 1971, the Hawaiian Congresswoman Patsy Mink and the Oregon Congresswoman Edith Green were the leaders who wanted women to pursue their own dreams without gender discrimination, and they ran with it. Uh, I can safely say in this room, uh, just about everybody graduated high school prior to 1972, right? Prior to 72. Uh, so let me ask the women, not the men, just the women, what were your opportunities for careers? What nursing. fields? Nursing? nursing? Teaching? Nursing. Nursing, teaching, secretarial. And you always could become an operator. Number, please. But that was, for the most part, that was where women were steered. Women were, told, were never told, oh, you could be a doctor. You could be a lawyer. Uh, but they told you, well, you could be a secretary or a nurse. Uh, so anyway, Patsy Mink and Edith Green wanted to change that as late as 1971. January, or rather June 23rd, 1972, <coughs> Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress, signed into law by, uh, please call me Dick, Dick Nixon. The sponsors of Title IX are Birch By, he's an Indiana Democrat, uh, in the Senate, Edith Green, the Oregon Democrat in the House of Representatives, but this was a bipartisan effort. Uh, Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program or activity, uh, receiving any type of financial federal assistance. Uh, oh, this is San Francisco. Uh, there is a neat museum whenever I'm out in San Francisco on Pier 39, uh, and it features pinball games or pinball machines from the 19-teens and 1920s and all these other games and gadgets from the turn of the uh, 19th century into the 20th century, including a Nickelodeon. Uh, put your nickel into the Nickelodeon, right, Teresa Burr? Anyway, it says, to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. And basically they tell you, be subservient to your husband because that is what it was like back in the 19th century. Uh, they came along, anybody here whose mother was a flapper? <laughs> anybody? Well, there they are, the flappers. Uh, the flappers were educated women in the 1920s who did not want to have the same lives as uh, 
their mothers or their grandmothers and they went out and they had a good time and they wore short dresses and they put makeup on and heavy duty lipstick and wore heels and they smoked and they drank at speakeasies. Uh, which of course would cause problems for the establishment because they thought they were a threat to the country. Uh, a young woman with a short bob hairstyle, cigarette dangling from her painted lips, dancing to a live jazz band, Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington or Cab Calloway back in the day. Flappers roamed through the roaring twenties enjoying the new freedoms ushered in by the end of the First World War and the dawn of a new era of prosperity urbanism and consumerism. Um, petting parties, uh, these are where people just made out in colleges, same bed. That's what they did, petting parties back then. Uh, this guy looks like Ringo Starr and that guy looks like Orson Welles, if you look at them. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, definitely. yeah, I mean, and, you know, they're the, they're, that's petting, petting party in college. Uh, the 1920s kicked off with the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave white women uh, the vote. African American women, like African American men, were restricted from voting through literacy and poll taxes. Asian American communities were still restricted from suffrage uh, through literacy tests, property restrictions, and voter intimidation. Um, talking about Asian American communities, this is Komako Kamura. Uh, October 23rd, 1917, and she's leading a suffrage, a suffrage parade in San Francisco. It wasn't until 1943 and the passage of the Magnuson Act that Chinese immigrants could begin naturalizing as U.S. citizens. Truly broad access to American citizenship and voting rights not available to Asians and Asian Americans until the immigration and National Nationality Acts of 1952 and 1965. So any of you want to dress like that? <laughs> back in the day, that was very fashionable back in the day in the 1920s, but they disappeared. Uh, women also joined the workforce in increasing numbers, participated actively in the nation's new mass consumer culture, enjoyed more freedom in their personal lives, and it comes to a halting end. Despite the heavy freedoms embodied by the flapper, real liberation and equality for women remained elusive in the 1920s. Back home during the Depression, 25% unemployment, men are going to get the jobs first, and then if there are any jobs, they go to women. Rosie the Riveter, was she a real person or not? Mm, yes. Yeah, actually, she was, we think. There are two Rosie the Riveters. One's Norman Rockwell's Rosie the River, who was a real person, and she was based on somebody who was working at a naval station outside of Oakland, California. Rosie the Riveter, and you still see Rosie the Riveter today in women's forums, Rosie the Riveter was the star of a campaign aimed at recruiting female workers for defense industries during World War II, and she became perhaps the most iconic image of working women, and that remains true through this day. American women entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers during World War II. Between 1940 and 1945, the female percentage of the U.S. workforce increased from 27% to 37%, and by 1945, nearly one out of every four married women uh, one out of four, every, uh, nearly one out of every four married women worked outside the home. That's Norman Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter. And Norman Rockwell actually apologized for that picture of Mary Elizabeth Doyle. Um, he made her a lot bigger than she was. She was working in Vermont, she was the model, and he made her look Amazon-like, and she was actually a petite woman, but uh, there's Norman Rockwell's Rosie the River. Is this Rosie or is this Naomi? Well, what does it look like? Does she look like Rosie the River? She probably is Rosie the River. Naomi Parker Fraley, who was photographed working in the machine shop at the Naval Station in Alameda County, California, outside of Oakland, could be Rosie. 
In this 1904, the 1942 photo you just saw, she sported a polka dotted bandana, but nobody knows for sure. The call for women to join the workforce during World War II was meant to be temporary, and women were expected to leave their jobs after the war ended and the men came home. If women wanted to keep their jobs, and most did it because they wanted them out, they could expect up to an 80% pay cut if they wanted to stay. And that brings me into your generation. Um, oh, 1950 school book. So some of you, how many of you took home economics? Okay. How many of the boys should have taken home economics? Yeah. Like me. Because I still don't know how to thread a needle. Uh, I, you know, I ruined hard-boiled eggs uh, and all that. We took shop where I nearly killed Mr. Burkhart, the shop teacher, because my lathe the machine wasn't wasn't strapped down, all of a sudden it goes flying, takes this thumb out, as you can see my thumbs are messed up, nearly killed David Tobias and almost got uh, Burkhardt. Anyway, so these are some of the things that, uh, this was a school textbook for home ec. Have dinner ready, because uh, plan ahead, uh, you know, right before dinner, just make sure it's out there when your husband comes home. Uh, prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to get yourself looking good again. Uh, because you don't want to greet them at the door looking terrible. Um, clear away any clutter. After all, you wouldn't want him to walk and step on the toy, right? Clear away clutter. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes, wash their face, wash their hands, brush their hair. Make them look good for their father coming home. Uh, minimize all noise. No, no music, nothing. You want your husband to come home clear of mind without being bothered by any distraction. Uh, and of course, some don'ts, you know, uh, make sure you dress well and all that. Uh, make him feel comfortable. Make, how do you make him feel comfortable? Wrap yourself in saran wrap naked? Is that what you do? I can't take that for as original. That's what Ted, remember Ted Brown on WNEW Radio? Anybody listen to WNEW radio back in the day, William B. Williams? Well, I worked there when I was 21 years old. Ted Brown used to play David uh, Ross's The Stripper and told the uh, women in the audience, greet your husband, just wrap yourself in saran wrap when they come home. The husband comes home. <laughs> listen to him. If he's got a problem, listen to him. Let him get him off his chest. Uh, make uh, the evening his. Don't bother him. Just make the. And this was in a school textbook. This was a school textbook used in the 1950s. Uh, oh, I speak at the West Orange, New Jersey Library every once in a while, the public library. And one day I was there a little early. I was doing a Sunday talk, and the doors opened at 12. I was there at 10 to 12 because we we're setting up. I was going to do a 12:15 talk. Anyway, and I took a picture of this because it was interesting to me. West Orange Public Library, Library Board of Trustees, Mrs. Simon J. Griffinger, President, Samuel A. Cristiano, uh, Roger W. Uh, Doran, Herbert J. Dwyer, Mrs. Alex J. Katz, James J. Sheeran, Mayor, uh, Dr. Rexford S. Soda, Superintendent of Schools, William H. Lehman, architect. Do, do you detect something there, what I just said on that plaque? Yeah. The women had no names. They were misses. Uh -huh. They were misses. Women in the, who were married in the 50s and 60s into the 70s, if you got a wedding invitation, it was Mr. and Mrs. Alvin D. Dark, but it wasn't, didn't have the woman's name on it. Mrs. and Mrs. And I was doing this talk one day in uh, Riverdale, uh, in the Bronx, and this woman said, you've made me sad. I said, why did I make you sad? She said, I didn't know I didn't have a name. She said, come to think of it, all the invitation, Mr. and Mrs. Morris. Now, Morris was a good provider and all that, but I had no name. How many of you used to get mail, Mr. and Mrs., mm -hmm. with your husband's name on it? Mm -hmm. That was custom in the 1960s. Oh, anybody want to be a stewardess? 1965? Uh, welcome aboard Delta. Stewardess applications must be between 20 and 26. 
never married and in radiant good health, must adhere to strict figure control standards. I'm doing this talk one day in New Jersey over at uh, Richfield, and this woman told me I was a stewardess from United uh, Airlines in the 1960s, and she said, yeah, they put me on a scale almost every day, and every two weeks they took my measurements to make sure they were still the same. Uh, they did not want her to gain a single ounce. Uh, straight teeth and legs, clear skin. Oh, and you have to be white, but that's not in there because they didn't want to get in trouble. Uh, willing to retire between the ages of 30 and 32 to take on the greater complexities of marriage. That was an ad for Delta Airlines 1965. Oh, how many of you remember Password with Alan Loving? Remember the game Password? Okay, well, there's Mitch Miller and there's Carol uh, Burdett. Anyway, so if you're a civilian, a civilian would be a contestant. If you were a male, Alan Ludden, and he wouldn't be the only one. This would apply to other game shows as well. He would ask, what do you do for a, a living? If, if the woman was not married and they introduced her to Miss So-and-so, uh, Alan Ludden and the other contestants would, or the other uh, MCs would say, are you a working gal? And if the woman was married, what does your husband do for a living? Because they assume all women were housewives. Uh, oh, the family passport. That is my father-in-law and my mother-in-law and the family passport back in the 1960s. Well, at least my mother-in-law got her name and her picture on there. But all the other information was for my father-in-law. She was a second-class citizen. Um, she's lucky to even be on the passport. Uh, the woman on the right is my friend Fran. That's my wife and that's me. And that is Hawaii. And Fran, you're too pretty. Fran Cummings was uh, head of uh, various college science departments, but she really didn't want to be a scientist. She graduated, or a science teacher rather, she graduated uh, valedictorian around 1956 of her high school in Utah. In fact, the top two students in that class were Fran and another woman. So it's 1956, and she wants to be a geologist. She has, her family is filled with geologists. She likes going on digs with her brothers, and she wants to go to school and major in geology. Well, she had the marks. She had the test scores, too. Um, but uh, she also had looks, and that was her downfall. Uh, she was rejected by a number of schools. And then one day, she got so fed up she wanted to know, why are you rejecting me? And the guy at the school said, well, listen, uh, Fran, you're right. You have the marks. And you're right. You did very well on the SATs and all that other stuff. And your family, yeah, they're geologists, and you have some experience in this. But uh, Fran, you're too pretty. And because you're too pretty, I worry that if I send you out on an archaeological, archaeological dig, or geological dig, with the men, they're going to be looking at you instead of concentrating on what they're supposed to do. She never became a geologist. Why discrimination against women? This one, 1956. Hey, remember Jack Jones, the singer? No? Yes. Yes, how many of you remember Jack Jones? Okay, big time singer, big time singer. Ever watched The Love Boat? Yeah. The Love Boat? Yeah. He sung the theme song for The Love Boat, among other things. Anyway, Jack Jones' father, Alan Jones, took Zippo Mark's place in the Marx Brothers movies, Night at the Opera, 1936. So he came from a showbiz family. Uh, Wives and Lovers, remember that song, Wives and Lovers? It was, uh, well, one of the top hits of 1963. On May 12, 1964, Jack Jones won the best vocal performance, male, at the 6th Annual Grammys. But there was a problem with the song written by Burt Bacharach and Hal David. This lyric, day after day, there are girls at the office, and men will always be men. Don't send them off with your hair in curlers. You may never see him again. 
That was a hit song, 1963. That was a hit song. Okay, and there's Jack Jones, circa 1999. My favorite song is not Wives and Lovers because it either creates a laugh, I've heard some people laugh here, or someone raises a fist because it was roughly back in the day where Betty Friedan and uh, Gloria Steinem and Bernice Sadler and Bella Abzug, by the way, Congresswoman Bella, Bella Abzug, my Aunt Pearl, was her chief of staff. Um, anyway, so the National Organization of Women was forming. And so he said, they were irate. They blamed the whole thing on me. I didn't even write it. Uh, and I won a Grammy for it. Wives and Lovers is a very chauvinistic song telling a woman she must mind her looks and her hair and makeup and be ready for her husband when he came home from work like that's all she has to do. That didn't sit well. When I sing it, I'll say in the middle of it, can you imagine <clears throat> me singing this to Gloria Steinem? Oh. It's Patsy Mink. Now let me ask all of you, not just the women, all of you, how many have daughters or granddaughters or great-granddaughters who are doctors or lawyers? You have? Daughter or doctor. Daughter or doctor. What, uh, what year did she graduate high school? Uh, uh, high school. Okay. You have? You raise your More hand? More than one. You have what? More than one. More than one. Right. Girls? Yeah. Okay. Who are doctors? No, they all oh. were scientists. Scientists. By 1960. Okay. So, about 1960? Yeah, that's they are. It. <laughs> yeah, that's unusual. It is. That is very unusual. I met. Uh, Ro yeah, I met Rosalind Yellow, who you probably don't know. She won the 1978 Nobel Prize for Physics, mm -hmm. and uh, she lived over in the Bronx. And I was interviewing her one day, and that's why 1960 raises an eyebrow a little bit because um, Rosalind Yellow was telling me that um, after she won. She never really wanted to be a scientist. What she wanted to do was be a housewife. And this is the 1940s. And her husband said, uh, you're too smart to hang around the house cooking eggs. He pushed her into the field. And eventually, she won uh, the Nobel Prize in 1977-78. One of the first, the only Nobel Prize winner I ever interviewed, as a matter of fact. Patsy Mink was the congresswoman from Hawaii that helped push Title IX. Patsy Mink was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School and became the valedictorian of her graduating class in 1944. Hawaii is not a state. It's a territory. But she is an American citizen. Keep that in mind on this story. She is an American citizen. It was law school after she graduated Maui High School, and then back, well, she went to University of Hawaii, then to law school, and then back to Hawaii for me. She was politically ambitious, and in 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. Uh, a year later, the bicameral territorial legislature was dissolved when Hawaii became a state in 1960, and then the special election to uh, select a representative from Hawaii to the Congress, Mink lost to Daniel Anoye. 1962, she ran for election to the Hawaiian State Senate. She was successful. Two years later, she was victorious in her race for a seat, United States House of Representatives. She's an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress to use the gym. She couldn't use the gym. She and other women could not be with these guys swinging Indian clubs at the gym. It's not much of a gym when you look at it, but there they are. They're in the gym. You got one guy in the sled that was doing that. You got the Indian clubs and all that. Mink was a champion of women's rights, but she avoided being characterized as a feminist. In the late 1960s, she became an increasingly outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. Uh, in Congress, Mink worked tirelessly on behalf of legislation, civil rights, including those of women and children, as well as health care, welfare, and education. After her college years at the University of Hawaii, Patsy Mink wanted to be a doctor, and she had the marks. 
She applied to 12 medical schools. How many do you think would accept her? Zero. Zero. Uh, about 12 years ago, I was doing a talk up at Stanford, and this guy was a retired doctor, went to medical school in 1960. And he said that uh, what, whatever school he went to, there were 96 students in that school. And uh, the dean of the school came in, and everybody is there, and he looks, he said, I want all the women to stand up, four women. And he said, what are you doing here, taking the place of a man? You're only here to find a husband. Oh. All four graduated. All four. But that's not unusual. I've heard stories about that, veterinarian school. Uh, I was on a cruise ship about five years ago speaking about this topic, and there was a retired vet. And he's telling me, he said, you know, there were 65 of us at Penn State University at veterinarian school, 55 men, 10 women. We're all alive. All 65 of us are still alive. And 55 of us are old farts sitting on cruise ships listening to guys like you. The other 10 are still working, either as vets, biologists, or scientists. He said uh, they had to overcome a lot of stuff, and they did. Uh, so, Patsy Mink decides, I'm going to law school. But she continued to face sexism. She's denied a job in the law firm because she was a married woman. Law firm in Hawaii. But it gets worse than that. She started to, uh, she tried to start her own practice. But government officials only allowed residents of Hawaii to take the bar exam. She's no longer a resident of Hawaii because she married some guy from Pennsylvania. Uh, she graduated University of Chicago Law School. She married John Mink while she was in Chicago. Uh, Mink was from Pennsylvania. The couple never lived in Chicago or Pennsylvania. They lived in Hawaii. Although Mink had been born and raised in Hawaii, her husband John was a mainlander. That made Patsy Mink a non-resident of Hawaii. An American citizen, but you can't open up a law firm here because you're not a resident. Why? Because you married somebody from the mainland. Uh, she had to fight to take the bar exam. She got it. She won, passed the exam, became the first Japanese-American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. She was a Hawaiian congressman, 1965, or congresswoman, 1965 to 77, uh, and again, uh, 1989 to 2002 until she passed. And there's Patsy Mink, and there is um, Green, uh, Edith Green. Edith Green was elected as the representative for Oregon's third congressional district. She focused on women's issues, education, and social reform. 19, oh, let me ask you a question. Should a man and a woman with equal work experience in the same job be paid equally, yes or no? Yes. 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 Well, in 1955, Edith Green proposed the Equal Pay Act to ensure that men and women were paid equally for equal work. In 1961, the fascist Spanish dictator, Francisco Franco, passed an Equal Pay, Equal Work Law in Spain. Two years later, the bill was signed into law by John Kennedy, 1963, and guess what? It's never been applied evenly. Uh, and there's Edith Green for Congress. Library Services Act, that she was part of that, that provided access to libraries for rural communities. The Higher Education Facilities Act in 1963, Higher Education Act in 1965 and 67, both hers. She got these derisive nicknames, Mother of Higher Education and Mrs. Education. They were not, they, they were not there. They weren't plotted, sent to her. Uh, I went to Spring Valley High School in Rockland County, New York, about 30 miles outside of Midtown Manhattan. And uh, there were programs in that district because Rockland County exploded in the 1960s. So they did not have a culture, old boys club culture there. So they had programs for both girls and boys after school. But in many communities, they didn't. Uh, so she helped to introduce a higher education building contain provisions regarding gender equality in education. The Boston Marathon, 1967, as Catherine Switzer, who entered as Kay Switzer. 
She grew up as the daughter of a major in the U.S. Army, so failure was not an option. While she was studying at Syracuse University in the mid-1960s, one of her coaches told her that a fragile woman couldn't run the Boston Marathon. So she trained in secret and entered the races K. Switzer. Now I have this question, the guys don't answer it, but women should answer it. If you are a fragile woman, and you're also the weaker sex, how come you outlive men? As Myron Cohn said, because you want to. <laughs> you want to. Anyway, oh, that's her boyfriend, Big Tom Miller. And this is Jock Steppel. And Jock Steppel's about ready to do this to Catherine Switzer, to send her face first into the concrete, but she's got a bodyguard who was with Syracuse University's football team as an offensive lineman, six foot two, 235 pounds. He is protecting her because they know something might go wrong. And the other thing was, he figured if she could do it, I could do it. And so he did. People who work for the marathon tried to physically pull her out of the race. When the uh, official, race, he was the guy who ran the uh, Boston Marathon, Jack, Jack Stemple, tried to remove her bodily from the race, her boyfriend, Big Tom Miller, 235 pound nationally ranked hammer thrower, who was also running the race, pushed Stemple to the ground. He was really worried that he was going to be charged with assault, even though Jack Stemple would have knocked his girlfriend at the time over. Can you imagine face first going into the concrete? Uh -huh. Get your hands out, Funny. bust that, something up. Oh, oh, she finished the race, four hours and 20 minutes. Time of nine, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Oh, I've got a question for you, not the men, just the women. Uh, if women were able to get the same higher education or access to the same higher education as men did, would that ruin education? No, of course, of course not. not. Of course not. But Title IX was highly controversial. And although some supported the law, others thought it would be too dangerous forcing schools to accept women because it would ruin American education. This is Ted Stevens, and this is the guy who is the absolute key to Title IX's passage. He's a Republican, and uh, he was from Alaska, and he was in favor of Title IX. And that's my friend Donna Deverona, who lives down in Stanford. She won two gold medals in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. I told Donna, you know what, because of that, you can never lie about your age. <laughs> she was born in 1947, so that makes her, what, 77 now. Anyway, but uh, she wins the two gold medals. Don is highly intelligent. Witty, too, has put up with my friendship for 40 years, so that, that's a plus anyway. But uh, so she lives down in, uh, in Stanford with her family. And uh, so uh, we were talking one day, and uh, she wins the two gold medals. She's really smart. She wants to get to Stanford University. You figure with all of those credentials, she should get a sports scholarship, right? Wrong. No sports scholarships to women, even though she has that around her neck, the gold medal. So she became an activist and remains an activist with Title IX to this day. Uh, and she said of Ted Stevens, without Senator, this is what she told me. Without Senator Stevens as co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. It's my friend Harvey Schiller. Harvey's about 88 years old now, runs a security company. Uh, he was the head of the Southeastern Conference, College Conference. and. Uh, brought women into the fold as athletes, and that's Ted Stevens, and there's Donna at the end of uh, that picture. There were a bunch of people who helped me with this talk, Harvey and Donna and uh, Nancy Hogshead, uh, Maker, who was, won a gold medal at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics in swimming. She's now a law professor at Rutgers University, and 
But Dan, your phone, you can't reach me right now. I'm with the late Shelly Saltman, and I'll tell you more about Shelly and the battle of the sexes between Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King, narrated by Howard Cosell, whose grandson lives down the road from here. Um, Justin, so I'm, I was friends with Howard, and I'm still friends with his, uh, his uh, grandkids, Justin, Colin, and uh, Jared. My ninth grade social studies teacher, Stewie Gates. Stewie Gates, Spring Valley High School, junior high school, 1969-70. Uh, so I don't remember if it was the 1969 portion or the 70 portion. Up until about seven years ago, Stewie was chasing fires in Stony Point, New York, and volunteer till the guy said, hey look, Stewie, we don't need you to go up to the third floor of a burning building anymore. You're 88 years old, just answer the phones. But anyway, so here we are. It's ninth grade. It's 1969, 1970. And um, Stewie decides he's going to tell all the kids in the class about the facts of life, scholastically. Now, I was a year ahead. I got thrown out in the kindergarten because I talked too much, and I was thrown in the first grade where I talked too much, but they thought it would be too much of a jump to put me into second grade, so they left me in first grade. In a sense, they left me behind. So anyway, I'm the youngest one here. I'm 13, and I'm listening to Stewart. And Stewie starts talking about, you're graduating here in June. You're going to be leaving Spring Valley Junior High School. And you're going to go up to the big school on Route 59, the high school, and next year in 10th grade, you're going to take the PSATs to see where you stand with the SATs. And then you take the real SATs in 11th grade and see where you stand in terms of marks. And then in 12th grade, you're going to figure out what school you want to go to and what you want to do for a living. Okay. And he said, and for you girls. And for you girls. You girls, some of you are going to college for three letters. You want to guess what the letters are? Yeah. <laughs> this was 1969-70 that Stewie was still pushing this. The three letters, of course, are MRS. MRS. Well, he wasn't the only one who thought this way. That is Senator Birch Bayh, the Indiana Democrat. And Birch Bayh is pushing Title IX on the Senate floor. This is the thinking of the time. In his remarks on the Senate floor, Bayh said, we're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband and who go on to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband and finally marry, have children, and will never work again. Sounds like Stewie, doesn't it? So it's just like Stewie. I like Stewie, actually. <laughs> he used to give us all kinds of tidbits that we could live by. Anyway, the desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman, remember the 1960 medical school guy I talked about, stems from such stereotypical notions. But the facts absolutely contradicts these myths about the weaker sex, and it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far-reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America something that is rightfully theirs. Let me ask a question, not of the men, of the women. Is education a right? Yes. yes. How many say it's a right? Yes. Wrong. It's a law. Oh. Okay. It's a law. It has never been presented as a right, it's a law. Uh, an equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the schools they want and apply those schools with the knowledge they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Ha, 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 that hasn't happened yet. It's been 61 years since Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Amendment, and we still don't have equal pay in the United States for women. Uh, at the time also, uh, I found this. This is at Henry Ford Museum, this little placard. Uh, in the 1800s, women's rights denied. Uh, American women have fewer rights than a male inmate in an insane asylum. <laughs> women cannot vote, serve on a jury, testify in court, hold public office, attend college, or practice law. Some did. 
uh, if, if a woman were married, it was illegal for her to sign a contract, inherit property, Martha Washington did, uh, keep or invest her own earnings and have automatic rights for children. Women were expected to center uh, their lives around the family and house, obey their husbands in all matters, I hear nervous laughter on that one, <laughs> not voice a strong opinion in public, and behave in a refined, polite way. <laughs> That's what they were supposed to do. The Title IX, uh, or Title IX, was enacted as a follow-up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which took care of a lot of things except women issues. Uh, the act uh, was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in the areas of employment and public accommodations back on July 7, 1964, when Lyndon Johnson signed it into law. The 1964 Act did not prohibit sex discriminations against persons uh, employed at educational institutions. In other words, if you were a college professor, a woman college professor, on track for tenure, they could say, no, nope, you had no recourse. You had to accept what they said. Uh, women students were denied equal opportunities under the law in academics. Women applicants were routinely denied access to medical, law, and other graduate schools, and women athletes denied equal participation in sports. Uh, if a woman did get in, say, to the University of Pittsburgh, I had this woman tell me this a number of years ago, uh, she was an engineering student, and there was the engineering school, and there were a lot of restrooms in that engineering school, and they could have converted one of the restrooms into a woman's room inside the building. They didn't want to. They, uh, I don't know how many of you have been in Pittsburgh in the winter at the University of Pittsburgh. The wind comes this way uh, off of Lake Erie. Uh, although Lake Erie is far away, but it still comes that way. Uh, it's cold. They would not give women a restroom because they wanted to get the women out of the school. So they had to walk halfway across the campus to use the facility. 1966. Uh, Similarly, female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise of women in all academic disciplines and sports at every level in many ways is a direct outgrowth of the ti a landmark Title IX legislation. And oh, he did it. Oh, he did it. I'm not a crook. I did that. I helped women. I've helped hundreds of thousands of women. To Call me Dick. Anyway, Congress passed the final version of the bill, June 1972, and Dick Nixon, I can't call him Richard Nixon. He told me to call him Dick. Dick Nixon signed it into law June 23rd. And Title IX has been challenged 24 times in Congress. The last in 2007, uh, the George uh, W. Bush, Secretary of Education, Rod Brooks, was trying to find out if it was still needed. And he sent emails to every college student in the United States. Do we still need Title IX? Because if they pull it, you're going to see a lot of women's rights on campuses gone. Although, there are so many women lawyers who benefited from this today. You mentioned the lawsuits. How many lawsuits there would be if Title IX is pulled? Oh, there I am. Uh, when Nixon signed the bill, he spoke mostly about desegregation. Busing didn't mention the expansion of educational access uh, that he just made a law. And like I said, hundreds of millions of women, your granddaughters, your daughters, your great daughters, great great granddaughters, all benefited from Richard Nixon's pen. Uh, Bernice Sandler, God bless you, Title IX. This is something you probably never thought of. She was one of the activists. If girls got pregnant, they were literally kicked out of most schools. Very often, people knew who the father was. He didn't receive any punishment at all. Women teachers also faced tough consequences for getting pregnant, routinely losing their jobs when they began to show. In New York City in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, 
If you are a married woman, you are not getting a teaching job. You are not getting a teaching job. And that was the case in many other places as well. This is Bernice Guerra. 1965, she's talking to her husband. She's a housewife in Queens. There's got to be more to life than using pledge on the table to make the table shine. I got to do something. And her husband, Steve, said, all right, well, what do you like? I don't know. Well, have you thought about it? No. Then she thinks about it. She says, I like baseball. I want to become a baseball umpire. She becomes a baseball umpire. 1969, Bernice Guerra received a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League. But she receives a telegram right before the season starts from the uh, uh, president of the NAPBL, Philip Python, saying your contract has been disapproved and is invalid. While the baseball executive and Doherty claimed that umpires needed to be 21 to 35 years old, a minimum of 5 foot 10 inches tall, weigh at least 170 pounds. Well, Guerra was 38. Five foot two, oh, that's a song, yeah. five foot two, eyes are blue. Five foot two tall, weighed 126 pounds. She had experience umpiring for the National Baseball Congress in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and also in her court statement said that she worked in the recreational programs in the slums. And there she is. Uh, the New York State Division of Rights, first the New York, Pennsylvania Professional Baseball League, uh, the court ruled that being a man is not a bona fide occupation of quality for women. In other words, a woman could blow a call just as easy as a man blows a call. You're out. Say, out. Say, I say you're out. That was the wrong call. Could you be a man or a woman doing that? Is it a man? Of course not. On June 24th, 1972, Bernice Guerra, after three years of court battles, the day after Nixon signs uh, Title IX into law, she gets onto the baseball field uh, in Geneva, New York, umpiring a double header uh, between the Geneva, Rain uh, Geneva Rangers, the Texas farm team, and the Auburn Phillies. Uh, and there she is. She's getting ready to go to work. Well. Tell me what you think of this mentality. She's staying at the equivalent of a Super 8 Motel or Hotel 6 in Geneva, New York, which is beautiful during the summer, by the way. It's just gorgeous up in, up in Figure Lakes. But she goes to the hotel, she checks in, and there are these eight guys outside screaming and yelling that she doesn't belong on the field to the point where somebody throws a rock and breaks a light. Uh, not only are they assaulting her verbally, but everybody else who's doing whatever you do in a Super 8 motel, no cops, nobody's arrested for throwing a rock, breaking a light. Think of that. Think of that mentality. But she does uh, prepare. She tries to keep them out of her mind. Uh, she's in the motel room studying baseball plays and professional league rules. She doesn't eat, her stomach churns at uh, the mention of food, and she gets on the field. You should be peeling potatoes. That is Norman, uh, that is uh, Campbell, the, uh, Nolan Campbell. He is the manager of that team, the, uh, 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 the uh, Auburn Phillies, and there she is. Now, in minor league baseball, particularly at this level, there are only two umpires. One is behind the plate, the other one roams the field. And it's quite a big field, but she's roaming it. And the umpires work usually well together. This doesn't happen. She was berated by the Auburn manager, Nolan Campbell, for reversing a double play call. She resigned between the games of the doubleheader, citing lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. Campbell told her, you should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. Oh, man. Out. Now, the other umpire's job is basically to go to the umpire, fellow umpire, and basically calm the umpire down, and the manager is supposed to leave the field. But in this case, the other umpire put his arm around Nolan Campbell and walked him back to the dugout. She saw that, she realized it's over. 
Um, anyway, she quits in between games of the double header. Bernice would always say, Bernice would always say, I could beat them in the courts, but I can't beat them on the field, her husband Steve Garrett said. She quits, but she stays in baseball. She became a community relations director with the New York Mets back in Queens. She liked baseball. That's what she wanted to do. And there she is, the woman in blue, Bernice Garrett. Uh, after the final out, she left the field, never to return as a professional league umpire. When I got in the car, I broke down. She resigned between games and double header, the lack of cooperation from the umpires. Critics condemned her for quitting. They said her resignation closed the door for other women in baseball. Her response, how could I close a door that was never opened? It's my father-in-law with Billie Jean King. Uh, my father-in-law was a groupie. Back in the uh, 1980s, uh, when I was a young guy uh, doing reporting, virtually every day we had something at Sardi's or the 21 Club or uh, the Carnegie Deli or the Stage Deli. And uh, so we were always there doing something and he'd tag along with me and unbeknownst to me he would take pictures of people, uh, which I was embarrassed by, but now I'm happy because when I give a lot of talks, I got all these people that he was with that I could use. I like Billie Jean King. I've known Billie Jean King for 40 years. She is quite funny. She is quite witty, great sense of humor, very, very smart, but tough, but very tough. Uh, civil rights pioneer or not, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You think so? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, she's a civil rights pioneer. Uh, she uh, was a pioneer long before people's attention or caught people's attention long before the Battle of the Sexes. How many of you remember the Battle of the Sexes? Where Billie Jean King takes on Bobby oh, Briggs. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That was a made for television spectacular most of my how it goes. Um, I'll talk about that. My friend Shelley promoted that. I'll tell you some about some of that in a few minutes. Uh, while Patsy Mink is pushing ahead in Congress, Billie Jean King at the same time is pushing ahead in tennis. Uh, women's tennis was struck in old traditions and left women athletes as second-class citizens. Billie Jean King, who was off the streets, she was not a country club tennis player. She learned the game on the streets in the San Francisco Bay Area, decided to push ahead. And there she is in 1967. In 1967, she took on the United States Lawn Tennis Association and its policy of paying top players under the table to guarantee their entry into tournaments. King denounced the USLTA's practices as corrupt and kept the game highly elitist. 1968, she won 750 pounds for taking the Wimbledon title, while uh, Rod Laver took home 2,000 pounds. The uh, purses, men, 14,800 pounds, women, 5,680. At the uh, 1970 Italian Open, the singles champion, Illy Nastassi, paid $3,500 U.S., while Billie Jean King got $600 U.S. The U.S. LTA was mad at Billie Jean King and other women tennis players, and they decided to starve them out in 1970. No tournaments for you. Well, there's uh, 1972, Billie Jean King winning the U.S. Open in Forest Hills. She pushed for equal prize money in the men's and women's games. After winning the U.S. Open in 1972, she was paid $15,000 less than the Stasi and threatened to sit out the 1973 Open if the prize money was not equaled by the following year. In 1973, the U.S. Open became the first major tournament to equal uh, to offer equal prize money for men and women. They didn't even listen to John Kennedy. They did it because of Billie Jean King. How many of you remember the Virginia Slims cigarette commercial? You've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You've got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. It's condescending, isn't it? Yet, I was up in Richfield, New Jersey, uh, Richfield, Connecticut, about five years ago at the library doing this stuff. And a woman came to me afterward, or during the, the thing, she just got up and talked, which is fine with me, I don't care. And she said, 
That commercial appealed to me, even though I was not a smoker. It was the first commercial that I didn't have to wash a floor, I didn't have to clean a table, I didn't have to give kids breakfast. They talked to me as an adult, even though it was totally condescending. She was about 22 or 23 at the time. Uh, you've come a long way, baby. So they were capturing some, at least, eyeballs for the commercial. Formed in 1970, the Virginia Slim Circuit eventually became the basis for the later WTA tour. Players dubbed the Original Nine rebelled against the United States Lawn Tennis Association due to the wide inequality between the amount of prize money paid to male tennis players and to female tennis players. The Nine, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Christy Pigeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Heldman, Carrie Melville-Reed, Judy Tatter. All of those players put their careers on the line because they decided to go and participate in an unauthorized renegade tournament in Houston sponsored by Virginia Slims. They dared the men in charge to you know, suspend them forever. They called their bluff. They won. The tennis people backed down. Uh, this is, uh, well, uh, the Virginia Slims tour starts, and Billie Jean King one day told me it's all about blood money. It was blood money. Uh, she would go from place to place to place to place, and uh, we'd get turned down. Get turned down all the time. Ellen Merlo was the directing, director of marketing for Philip Marsh USA, makes the Virginia Slim cigarettes, and noted that uh, the company had earlier sponsored the tour from 1971 through 78. When we get involved in any promotion, obviously, it's to create a greater visibility for our brand. But we've never ever asked the player to endorse our product. Well, they never had to. The reason they never had to was because they carried Virginia Slim's bags. It was Virginia Slim's signage all over the floor and banners and wherever they played. Now, as far as uh, Bobby Briggs and Billie Jean King, Bobby Briggs and Billie Jean King, uh, my friend Shelley Saltman promoted that at the Houston Astronaut. And um, I talked to Billie Jean King about it, like 2008, 2009. And I said to her, why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? I know you did it because you got paid a lot of money for it, more than you got ever got before. I said, why'd you do it? And uh, as you look at Brandy Chastain, and she said, uh, got to remember, Title IX. It was Title IX in those days. It just started. We did not want to weaken it. And uh, Margaret Court lost to uh, Bobby Riggs in an exhibition. And she said, I knew I had to play. I said, yeah, but you were 29. He's 55. If you beat him, you beat a 55-year-old man. If you lose to him, you lose to a 55-year-old man. And she said, yeah, she was between the rock and the hard place. The actual event. Well, it's put together, and my friend Shelley is uh, running the event. And Billie Jean King is carried into the Houston Astro. First of all, Salvador Dali is there. And he's talking to people that look like, this is part of the art project, look like aliens. Billie Jean King is carried into the uh, arena on the litter. Four hunks from Rice University have her on the shoulders, uh, and they're walking in. Meanwhile, Bobby Riggs comes in with a rickshaw. And uh, I said to Shelley, I said, I know where you found the track and field guys. Where'd you find the rickshaw? And then Shelley was working for 20th Century Fox at the time in Los Angeles, the lot where he was eventually beaten up on by Evil Knievel and never got a source sent, even though Evil Knievel, a jury found him that he had to pay Shelley $13 million. Evil Knievel hid all his money. And anyway, he said, yeah, he said, I went to, I went to the props department, we got the rickshaw. And Bobby Riggs was surrounded by Riggs pigs, which were busty women, uh, about four of them. And I said, where'd you get the women? He said, we went to a strip club and gave them 200 bucks, and they were there. Uh, and uh, so Bobby Riggs, Sugar Daddy, was sponsoring Bobby Riggs, and he gives Billie Jean King 
uh, sugar daddy, uh, big lollipop, and Billie Jean King gives him a baby pig, <laughs> Riggs Pigs. And I said, where'd you get the pig? He said, oh, we borrowed it from a nearby farm. <laughs> what hot air was doing that? And Cosell is doing an interview with Riggs, and he says, Bobby, why are you going to win? Because she's a woman. Uh, it was a silly exhibition. Didn't mean anything. But you know, Billie Jean King was, you know, hey, women, 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 and and all that. But uh, she felt that it, there was a need to defend women, and it was really stupid because women were now accepted at medical school. They were now accepted at law school at this point. So much so that in November of 1973. New Jersey allowed girls to play Little League Baseball. The pendulum had swung, and more women were able to get real court, not that being a, a nurse isn't a real course, but when I say real courses, they were allowed to go to medical school, law school, engineering school, veterinarian school, and even though people sued at all levels, they lost trying to revoke Title IX. But um, anyway, Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King became friendly, and in his final years, he was short of money. Billie Jean King actually sent him money. She'll never say this, but I know people have told me this. Mm -hmm. She sent him money to help him with his expenses as he got to his 70s. Uh, that's Brandy Chastain. That's the 1999 United States women's soccer team, and they won the World Cup. And years later, I talked to uh, Brandy Chastain, and we're talking about the failures of the uh, uh, American Basketball League, the Women's League, and uh, a bunch of uh, failures in soccer, uh, including the Women United Soccer Association. And I said, what's going to turn it around for women that they'll get respect in sports? She said, when we have women CFOs, when we have women CEOs, when we have women who are the head of companies. We need a good old girls network. And once we get a good old girls network, money will be flowing into women's activities. And now in the year 2024, you see that. You see that particularly in sports, but you also see it in startups. Uh, there are more women in law school today than men. There are more women in medical school today in the United States than men. So I guess the question, this is where we're going to end it. Did Title IX help or hinder women? Helped. 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 And I'm going to ask you another question. I think guys and women, were you told by high school guidance counselors you could be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a geologist? I don't think so. No, you weren't. No. They told you you're going to get married. Maybe be a nurse, maybe be a secretary, maybe be a librarian or a school teacher. Title IX has worked. It has changed women's lives. And the guy who I started with, Richard Nixon, is responsible with his pen. And he didn't even talk about it. Any questions, any comments? It's your turn. That was great. Thanks. Thank you.